This podcast is brought to you by Iron Temper Supplies. They're the group behind the Iron Gate International Tattoo Convention going down in Sydney, November 3rd, 4th and 5th at the Horden Pavilion. And I don't think Australia's seen a convention like this. It's going to be huge. There's more international artists than have previously been at any convention in Australia. Uh, it's invite only. They've just really curated the best lineup for a convention that Australia's ever seen. There's so much to do. There's going to be food trucks. There's going to be exhibitions. There's going to be competitions. Uh, come down to the Iron Gate International Tattoo Convention, November 3rd, 4th and 5th at the Horton Pavilion in Sydney. Let's get into the episode. Welcome back to the True Love Tattoo Podcast. Today, stoked, joined by Sophia Bourne, owner and operator of Hand in Hand in Sydney. Dude, thank you so much for coming. Hello. <laughs> Thanks so, for having me. My pleasure. So we've been starting each episode with basically the beginning of everyone's career, how you got into it, sort of when and what your introduction to tattooing was like. Yeah. Um, it all, I started tattooing 16 years ago. Wild. And <laughs> that's so long. Like it was when I first got my first job in a shop. Wow. Um, but then, you know, I was still probably only like cleaning and doing stuff for like a good year during that. But yeah. um yeah, it started like sixteen years ago. I had like left school early and I was just doing shitty jobs in between. And um but like always was drawing and stuff and a lot of my friends were like getting tattooed. So it was something that like I'd always thought about doing. Um, and then it just took me to like ride around to all the shops in Sydney um, asking for an apprenticeship. And out of like all the letters I sent, there was one place that like called me back in Campbelltown where I was like, where I grew up. And um, and they said that they'd take me on as an apprentice. So that's You were like, sending letters to shops? I sent a letter around to every shop. That's in awesome. Sydney. Yeah. And I said like, I've got a portfolio of drawings. I just want to be a tattooer. I'll work for free. I'll do whatever you want. Yeah. You just teach me. But yeah, this one like dodgy place in Campbelltown <laughs> like rung me and got me to come in. Um, it was kind of like a perfect little scenario because I was also like 17 at that time too. Right. So probably shouldn't have even really been working in a tat shop. Were you getting tattooed? Were you 17 and getting tattooed? I had a tattoo or like a couple of tattoos already because I also had like a fake ID <laughs> <laughs> when I was younger and um, had like gone to England, which is where I'm originally from. I'd gotten tattooed over there from s some shops. Um, so like that was probably where it started. And uh -huh. then like 17 came around and I was like, had left school and I just really wanted to get into tattooing. Right. So, kind of my so you were starting to get tattooed in the UK. Yeah. 17 with a fake ID. Yeah. And then you came, <laughs> what, what, what was it about tattooing that made you want to get into it? Um, I don't know because no one in my family or like any of our family friends like had ever had a tattoo. Right. I would say my family are quite, um, normal like conventional it, quite conventional yeah. this was definitely not part of their worlds or anything I never had like a crazy uncle who you know was covered in tats so I don't really know how I got exposed to it but I think it was just from like from as early like whatever early age it was I was always just a bit of a street kid and I was always hanging out with the wrong people who yeah. for me were the right people and right. So it's just kind of a mix of that stuff and like not being great at school and not necessarily wanting to have a career where it meant I'd need to go to college or uni. It was just like all those things sort of came together and then made like this little concoction of like wanting to be a tattooer as well as like having always been like drawing and stuff. But I knew I never wanted to be like an, a gallery artist or anything. Yeah, okay. Or go to uni and study art. It was kind of like the culture surrounding tattooing that also culture. appealed. Yeah. My yeah. friends were like, 
yeah, it was the it was the people I was hanging out with, and that like really all had something to do with like leading into tattooing, I guess. So you got the the call from the shop in Campbelltown. Yeah. Go in there. Was it sort of like a street shop? Sort of like a bit of everything yeah. coming in. It was a street That's shop. Like... It was really like old school. It was really dodgy. Yeah. And I think like I think I even knew then like I knew they were only taking me on because I was a young girl because I said I would work like seven days for free. Like it, I knew all the circumstances surrounding it, but right. I just wanted to tattoo that bad that I knew that that was my way in. That was the foot in the door. Yeah. How, like, how long were you there for? Like, was it short lived or were you there for ages? I was there for a year and I would have stayed there. Um, but the shop closed after a year of me starting there. Right. Cause, um, the, the owner, had to like go and deal with some stuff. So he closed up the shop. Had to deal with some stuff. <laughs> yeah. Right. So that shop closed and um, I went with some other guys who I was working with there to another shop in Liverpool. And then I worked there for like another three years after that. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Do you like those people that you worked with and moved there? Are you still like in contact with them? Like, yeah. 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 The second shop that I went to work at, um, that was also great for a time. Also street shop out in Liverpool, also a little dodgy, but like super fun. Um, that one has also now closed down just cause when the licensing came in, um, it's closed a lot of South Sydney, uh, Southwest Sydney shops. Mm -hmm. Um, so some of the guys are just not tattooing anymore at all. But there's one that one guy that I still like stay in contact with and we still like send each other messages like reminiscing back in those days <laughs> yeah. of what it was like to tattoo then. And yeah, it's really good. I, I feel like a lot of people listening might not be aware of like the whole tattoo licensing thing. So yeah. it was what you was, that was probably around 2013, 2014. Yeah. That it came in yeah. and it, it was only New South Wales and Queensland where you needed to apply and basically not have a criminal record and yeah. do like give your fingerprints and all sorts of stuff to become a licensed tattooer. Mm -hmm. and they were doing it to sort of try to stamp out like bikey shops and stuff like that or yeah. to deter people from doing home jobs and, and things as well. But it was only those two states and like your license, your New South Wales license wouldn't work in Queensland. So you'd have to get a completely separate yeah. license. And when it, I feel like when it started, it was like an absolute nightmare and you'd go and get it and they wouldn't even know yeah. that you go, you go to uh, service New South Wales or whatever. And it's like the person working is like a tattoo license. It's like yeah, it meant was to chaos yeah. actually at the beginning. It was total chaos. No one knew what they were doing. Like the people from the service New South Wales, the cops at the station, they would just look at you and think that you're so strange for going in there and being like, please take my fingerprints. <laughs> yeah. I, I want to continue working. Like yeah. it was just so crazy for a while there. I remember. You had to wait months to be able to get in because they obviously had people that they were actually booking. Yeah. So they'd say like, we're busy, just come back another time. They don't care. And it would take forever. And then I feel like by the time the first renewal of tattoo licenses came, they were telling you to give your fingerprints again as if your fingerprints had fucking changed for the first <laughs> yeah. time. It was just yeah. that like absolute shit show and, and no one knew what they were, what they were doing. Yeah. Uh, it, yeah, it's sort of like it, it changed, especially, yeah, in New South Wales and Queensland. Like a lot of shops closed, a lot of people that had been tattooing forever weren't eligible for licenses mm. and they had to stop or they just moved states. They'd yeah. move to another state. Yeah, I feel like a lot of people moved to Melbourne. Yeah, probably. Uh, from Sydney. Yeah. I also feel like it was really unfair that I, you know, in some way I would like to think it was the government like trying to care for the industry and the, the general public with closing down biker shops. But in some ways, like you're opening a box that's, it's also so complicated within that. Like why should someone who did have a criminal record or, or work with bikers not be able to do their job anymore? Yeah it sort of locked out people from actually their their living and yeah. their wage, even if they've had a pass and they've changed it now. Or initially at the beginning, I thought I'm not even going to get my license because I had worked in biker shops and that was my connection. Mm. So they could say to me all of a sudden, oh, well, then you can't be a tattooer anymore and I'm not connected with them now. I've never been part of a club or anything. So yeah. it 
there were so many little nuances that just really weren't figured out. And um, I still don't think they are even now, really. Yeah. We've just all had to like scramble our way around it. Yeah. It's, it's so, so bizarre. And yeah. I feel like the, the biggest like insult to injury was they put like a holographic piece of tribal on oh the license God, as well. When, so when our licenses came out, we're like, well, they've just put tribal on it? Yeah. That makes it the tattoo license? It's weird. It's like an actual hard plastic driver's license. Yeah, it's incredible. <laughs> and then they never, they, they just took a photo from my driver's license yeah. from when I was 20 and when I updated my tattoo license, like still now, it's a photo of me when I was 20. Mm. Like they've never updated the picture or anything. It's so crazy. Yeah. It's so weird. from that, you you were, how long were you at that second shop? The second shop I was there for then probably like another three or four years. Right. Um, and then I was sort of, I was around 21 um, and I had just been only ever working in street shops at the time, like there was no, I've got a style of tattooing or anything. It was just whatever walks in the door, you do it, mm -hmm. you learn everything. That's the tattoos you kind of do. But also around that time, when I was working in those shops, I was looking through tattoo magazines and like tattoo candy and stuff. And I could see that in the industry in Australia, there were, it felt like to me, a whole other side of tattooing that I had never known because I'd only known street shops, biker shops and just doing the bare minimum where in the magazines I could see people and one guy I want to say is like Shannon Richmond who really seemed like he was a tattooer who was coming from a more artistic side and like yeah. from this part of a tattoo world that I'd never seen or known of. And um, it wasn't until I had seen so much of his work that I was like, I'm going to try and work with this guy. Like, I really want to meet him. I just want to get to work with him because I, I felt like there was something there that I could go further with tattooing for once. Yeah. And um, it was around that time he did make a post that STR Body Modifications, his shop in the Central Coast in Wyong, they were hiring. So I, was, I wrote to him... And I said, I'm really interested. I want to come up. And he got me up for a trial. Um, that went horribly. <laughs> I, like He wanted me to do one tattoo, which I should have been able to do, but it took me all day. I think I was there for like eight or nine hours with this. Just from the guy. pressure of it or something? Just so terrified, like Shannon watching me. And it was like, for me, it was like a big break. Like yeah. it was really getting into a world of tattooing that like I had looked up to and like admired and wanted to like, I just wanted to be around him and learn properly. Yeah. And um, anyway, he said at the end of the day, he was like, that tap was fucking terrible. Oh, <laughs> oh my God. But he said, I can see something in you. So he hired me. Right. And I moved up to the Central Coast after that and started working with him up there. And like, what do you feel like change was it was it that your work was progressing artistically or was it you know how to conduct yourself as a business person or like what what do you feel like you were gaining most it, like working everything with changed yeah like the everything about my whole tattooing experience had completely changed but it was definitely um it wasn't a, about business or anything like that it was just I was fully relearning to tattoo. Really? He was knocking out every bad habit I'd ever been taught, everything I'd ever learned. The other shops, it's such a like fast paced hustle environment. It was all about just doing a tattoo, making some money and kicking them out the door. There was yeah. not that there wasn't any care, but it, even my mentors from the other shops, it was like the blind leading the blind. Like they yeah. also had just been doing their thing for a long time without ever thinking more like of the quality, making the quality of the work better. Yeah, definitely when more you're like, like quantity over quality. Yeah, like yeah. you're making a living, you're doing the tattoos that people are asking for, everything's fine. If, mm. if the system isn't broke, why fix it? But yeah. like, I just really wanted to, to then improve the quality of my work. And that is exactly what Shannon did for me. Like he really, really spun everything around and just basically retaught me on, re showed me everything. And so 
my maths is terrible. That's that's probably like five or six years into tattooing. Like, yeah. like that. Yeah, yeah, that's that's not even still like early early days. You know, yeah. like for a lot of people, they feel like so established and and secure in what they're about. Like yeah. by that point, you know, yeah. and to to get to that point and want to learn more and like push yourself and mm. and seek someone out to sort of work underneath them or, or with them like yeah. to develop your skills i feel like that's really admirable you know at, at like that sort of early stage yeah i don't i don't know if it was admirable or if that's just what it was like at the time right because i you know even in those five years of me tattooing and having tattooed every day for those five years not ever once did I think like, oh, I don't have a style that I'm specializing in. And um, there was no pressure from being good online because there was no online. Right. I didn't have like an Instagram until um, working at STR for, I think it was like a couple of years after that. So in a way, like there's no sort of like comparing yourself to other things. It was more like you just think, oh, I, I think maybe there could be something more. I could be doing something better. But it definitely wasn't thinking of or, or like maybe having that added pressure that new tattooers start with now. Yeah. And starting with even knowing that you want to do a certain style. Like yeah. that's not even an option. That was just something I've accidentally fallen into. How did you fall into the style of tattooing that you're doing now? Because it's like you do such beautiful like native flora and fauna inspired sort of tattoos. It's like that's what I first saw. Like my introduction to your tattoos was like that. Yeah. You know, I remember years like uh, I hit you up, got like a commission painting off you, you know. <laughs> it was like in my house for ages. <laughs> Is it now in the bin? <laughs> No, my ex-girlfriend has it. <laughs> but <I'm> sorry, <laughs> but like I, I remember seeing that, and it's like I'd look at it every day. It was in the lounge room every day. Wow. I think it was. Uh, what do I mean? There was definitely like a protea on it, and yeah, maybe sugar gliders or something. I can't remember. Crazy. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but so very later, so yeah. Yeah. So <laughs> so how did you? get to that was that through um, str that you started doing that or I even later say on? again through str yeah because like again at the beginning you wouldn't even you wouldn't even recognize any of those early tattoos that i'd done in those first five years at str um i was still doing it was still a walk-in shop um i was still doing everything but at that time you know shannon he he's always been an all-rounder a couple of other guys at the shop had sort of started doing their own styles or their own like sort of specific things that they wanted to hone in on. So it was at STR that then I started getting into Neo Trad. You know, like the oldest, the Neo Trad was like the Sailor Man and like the ships and all those kinds of things. And um, it was when sort of like a reference started coming in, like when you would use like a model face to turn into like a sailor guy or like a woman with a cat on her head and stuff yeah, like that. Yeah. So I really then really enjoyed do, doing Neo Trad and I was putting everything into that, all the chicks with the necklaces and every animal and all that kind of stuff. Was doing that for years at STR. And then from there, I guess then coming to the city after that, which I guess we can get to, I just kept chopping stuff out. I just kept getting rid of things. I would look at my tattoos from five years ago and be like, I've put way too much into that. It doesn't need five of these elements. Yeah. So I just kept cutting stuff, kept cutting stuff. And then it just ended up getting to a flower or an animal. Yeah. Okay. And that's it. Yeah. I feel like finding that restraint in like drawing is so hard. Yeah. It's like you just constantly want to just, oh, I'll just add another leaf. I'll yeah, do this. Yeah. And then next thing you know, you've just like added so many elements and just knowing, I, I feel I feel like it, sometimes it comes down to just confidence and, and like yeah. the more confidence you have in, in a design, you can like, all right, I'm going to leave it there. That's good. I don't need yeah. to keep adding more and more and more. And that's so hard yeah, to get to that really point. Hard. So as SCR, learn heaps under Shannon. Yeah. Where did you go from there? How long were you there for? I was at STR for probably then three years. Um, and in that time of the three years, I had gone to 
just one time do a guest spot at Shanghai Charlie's in Sydney because um, Shannon knew Bodhi. Um, so I'd gone down there, did a guest spot, loved it. Anyway, was working still STR. When I didn't want to live on the Central Coast anymore, I wanted to move back to Sydney. I thought the only shop I want to work at is Shanghai Charlie's. I wanted to work with Bodhi. My friend Toby Gawler was there. And then having gone there for that guest spot, I'd met all the other guys and stuff through them as well. So I just really liked that shop and it's where I had to go. I've always thought Shanghai Charlie's was just like one of the coolest shop names as yeah, well. It, it really is. Like everyone has said that from... Yeah. For years, like yeah. even customers and stuff, they just think it's really cool. It's I feel like people setting shops up now, like those names, no one really goes for those kind of names anymore because they'll yeah. just be like, who's Charlie? Yeah. Shit like, you know, shit <laughs> yeah. like that and everyone's just sick of answering questions. So yeah. like, so Shanghai Charlie's, what was, what was that? Was it a private studio? Was it a street shop? What kind of shop was Shanghai um, Charlie's? It definitely, definitely anyone could still go there. Mm -hmm. But it felt like the first private studio to, at that point to me, because I'd only ever worked in street shops, it did feel like to me like it was a private studio because it, it was on like a level one. Right. And it had a door that was always locked with a doorbell. And that was the first time I'd ever worked in a shop where I'd seen that before. So it really gave off private studio vibes. Yeah, definitely. Even though anyone could still like email and go there and get tattooed and stuff. Yeah. Yeah. It was quite exclusive. It was really, it was a perfect little mix of street shop stuff, still anyone being able to come, any style of tattoo being done. But I guess it just had the sort of like, yeah, exclusivity that um, now private studios seem to have. Yeah, definitely. Was it one of those ones where it's sort of like very little sort of signage downstairs it's very you got to yeah, know it's there yeah. to sort it's of go up real speakeasy vibes yeah. and like that was like Bodhi's whole like style as well and stuff like you know the Shanghai Charlie thing I think it, he got that idea from like opium dens <laughs> and stuff for, uh, so like it definitely had all those like little um similarities through it and it's like style and stuff yeah um but also I think that it was just great at the time to have good security in Sydney if you're not working for a certain type of person. Huge, definitely. And yeah, like around that sort of time, it's so turbulent. Like so many, so many things were going down, like in terms of like the bikies and stuff like that to, yeah. to you know, not have, not get to work and find your front window smashed in and, and stuff yeah. like that. It's like, cool, we're safe. We're upstairs, secured sort of door. Yeah. Yeah. I, I imagine at the, at the time when a lot of those kind of things were going on, yeah, yeah just feeling sort of secure that you're upstairs and you're safe. Yeah. Being massive. Yeah, it was huge. It was a big deal at the time. I think it was like quite fresh off the back of Josh having lost um Tattoo Dharma. So yeah, it was yeah. around that time. Yeah, I think Tattoo Dharma I think was firebombed. Yeah. At one point, which wasn't uncommon. It which is the crazy thing. I yeah. feel like similar to Queensland, but I feel like Sydney at the time was like pretty dicey for for that kind of yeah. thing and, and like so many people lost businesses yeah over just weird shit like that yeah so shanghai charlie's there was a sort of a group of you that yeah. uh went on to create something when shanghai charlie's inevitably like did shanghai charlie's close and it yeah. sort of like forced your hand a little bit to yeah, uh, it was what like are we? a happy accident happy um, accident in a way because so Bodhi, um, he just wanted to pack up and go to England. He wanted to move over there. Yeah. Um, it all felt like it happened quite quickly. So we were like, it was a little bit sprung on us. Um, there, I remember there being like a little bit of a scramble, but like, obviously it's fine. It, it, he had to do what was what he wanted to do yeah. for his life and it, it ended up being fine. But I just remember me and the three others. So at this group of us was myself, Demi, Willie, and Caleb. We were all working together at Shanghai Charlie's. We just remember like hearing that Shanghai Charlie's was gonna close. And I think all of us were like, oh, we don't wanna like separate or there was nowhere else in Sydney that any of us wanted to work at the time. It's near impossible to like go apply for a job as like a package deal where it's like yeah. all, all four of us <laughs> yeah, want a job at the same time. all four of us, please, yeah. So it's like that kind of sparked the, the sort of 
yeah. decision to open your own place? There was no way in hell that any of us were ready to open our own shop. How and old we, are you at this we point? We all knew it. At that point, oh, when did I open? When did we leave? So, oh, my God, sorry. I'm, I'm <laughs> trying to think of the time. When did I say I went to Shanghai Charlie's? It was uh, 2013-ish. Mm-hmm. Maybe like 2015 or 14 or 15. So I would have been like 25. Young. And we were all quite the same age, like yeah. me, Willie, Caleb and Demi. Um, but also like at that point, I don't think Willie had been tattooing very long because he was had a, you know, just only worked at Shanghai Charlie. So I think Caleb had worked there and a couple of other places. Demi was quite fresh still. Like all of us... And I know I'd been tattooing for a while, but even at like 15 or 16 years now, I still feel like I know nothing. Yeah. So at that time, we, we really were just like, this is so strange for us to be doing this, but we just wanted to stay together and we just had an idea. So we went with it and um, we ended up finding like this little place. Eventually, it took a long time because most places you go look at, you say you're a tattoo studio and the landlords want nothing to do with you. Yeah. Eventually we found this really cute little tiny two-story terrace house in Surrey Hills and we signed the lease and we just made it work. And that shop is known as? As Tattoo, Tattoo Rosies. Tattoo Rosies. Now, yeah. Yeah. So we like, yeah, we opened it. I think for a while we didn't even have a name. It was sort oh, really? of just like a little co-op and again, like a little private studio sort of vibe. Um, but then it ended up, we called it Tattoo Rosies because we were like, we've got to come up with a name for this place. Caleb's dog was gorgeous, always around. Her name's Rosie, Tattoo Rosies. Perfect. Perfect. We all agreed on it. And it has that similar vibe to Shanghai Charlie's. Yeah, you know? yeah Shanghai Charlie's, Tattoo Rosies. Yeah. So you like all of you sort of like early, mid-20s, signing a lease in Surrey Hills. Yeah. Starting a bit like... I feel like, especially, you know, you started in a tattoo shop at 17. It's like, was it one of those sort of moments where you're like, fuck, none of us know anything about business. Yeah. Like one of those, sort of like figure yeah. it out as you go. Yeah. Did anyone have know. like a bit more experience or a bit more like knowledge when it comes to that kind of thing? Or you're all just fucking. We were all just completely winging it. Like we were yeah. all just really in the unknown. But really, I have to say, is like great in uh, as being like, <laughs> he was always the more like organized person of the rest of us. We were <laughs> all a bit like loopy and like, oh, like help us. But really was great, like was quite good in, you know, getting stuff done and um, getting the ball rolling. He still wouldn't have had any idea of like running a business at that point. But yeah, you you all have some strengths that you can add to the the sort of co-op and his was just like all right guys let's get together and let's you know sign this and get this in on time and then you know Demi had her strengths with things Caleb had his I had mine so, so that's kind of how you got through it you just kind of like delegated roles within it where yeah, everyone just kind of like so. handles a certain component yeah, we would come together and obviously like do things together and then there would be things that like uh, we would just take on separately as well and and it just kind of worked. Yeah, it, it worked really well until like it came to um, some things where like, you know, if you have like four people's opinions on stuff, not yeah. everyone's always going to agree all the time. Yeah. So there would just be like little minor things where we're like, maybe it wouldn't get done because we would have to have like a vote between four different voices. Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's an even amount. It's, there can't yeah. be necessarily a majority rules. Yeah, you know? so like things like that got a little tricky, but also they were such like minor things. It didn't matter. The, yeah. the shop was working and it was really great. Yeah. For what it was, which is the happy accident. Yeah, that's huge. Yeah. So how long were you with Tattoo Rosies? So then um, Tattoo Rosies, I left in 2018. So we'd made it work like that um, for, yeah, four years. Um, yeah. We'd seen it go from like our little two-story terrace. Uh, it had then gone to three because the landlord of the entire building he wanted to put in like a third level. So it had also like grown in size. Um, but then uh, 
like one of us was going to be moving overseas. One of us was thinking about moving up to the coast. So it just kind of dissolved because of life stuff, I mm -hmm. think, you know, like people wanting to move on and have these different experiences. Considering we were so young when we did it, there was still a lot of things that we hadn't done, uh, like moving overseas and tattooing or whatever. Yeah, those sort of like bucket list things that when you're yeah. in your 20s, you want to go and experience it. Because there's yeah. so many, so many people that have been, you know, committed and open a shop like when they're like quite young mm. and they're committed to it and they're bunkered down and they don't get to travel or whatever because yeah. they feel that they're tied to it and they're, oh, I can't leave it. Like yeah. and they, they never get to go on and experience that stuff. Yeah. So it's sort of like, yeah, I guess at that point you're like, cool, we want to go and experience it's these awesome. career things or yeah. life experiences. Yeah. Wild. So you left Rosie's, everything's sweet. Mm-hmm. Where do you go from that? Um, from there. So, um, yeah, we'd all kind of dissolve because we all wanted to do our, our own next step. Yeah. And for me personally, my next step was now I've had this shop and like I really enjoyed it and I couldn't think of anywhere else I wanted to work after that. For me, the next step was to have my own shop. So I left there um, and then with the thought of just going straight to finding my own shop to open. Um, but again, the problem with finding a lease and someone saying yes, it meant that probably for the next year and a half, I just was working with Ellie and Elizabeth. Mm -hmm. Um, and we were working together in a private studio in Paddington because Ellie had had that space just where she was working by herself. And then she let Liz and I come and crash. Yeah. Um, so we were, us three girls were all working there together for a year and a half while I was looking for a, a shop. Yeah, but just the whole time, constantly looking for places, inspecting, trying to convince Being landlords. Down. Yeah, yeah. Wow. And, and so how many... How many places do you reckon you looked at before you finally found the one? I think I probably looked at maybe, well, I looked at a lot. I would have looked at like upwards of like 15 places. Wow. Um, but I definitely tried to go for and like put in the application for at least four or five. Yep. Um, there were a couple where they had even sort of said, oh yeah, you can have it. And then... Um, I would start the DA approval and then like never heard back from these two places because that's when everything starts getting complicated with a tattoo shop and the crossover to the licensing. Right. Um, so then it got to the stage where the owners would probably like, what is this and why is it so hard? And then just sort of like brush their hands of it. So what, and they just ghost you. Yeah. What yeah. We just like, we would even like call the real estate and be like, hello, like we're in the middle of doing this thing. And, um, the guy was just like never available to chat or something. What? It was just completely like they disappeared off the face of the planet. It was really, really weird. That's so crazy. And then you find a place in Roselle. Yeah. Which is the, uh, the area that I wanted to open okay. up in. But like why specifically that area? Um, I think because I'd worked in Surrey Hills at that point now for like years, like yeah. eight or nine years. And I really liked the city, um, but I was always living in the inner west, which isn't too far. That was fine. Um, but then at that point, it just felt like there were a lot of shops in the city. Right. Um, I, and, you know, there's a lot at this uh, that are like sort of near every corner anyway. Sorry, Hills so. alone, there's, yeah, there's a bunch. There's, there's yeah. Rosie's, there's uh, Illustrated Man, Little Tokyo, uh, Hibernia. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, there's a bunch. And, yeah, there's so yeah. many around there already. So it made sense to me because I was living in Roselle at the time. Um, I knew Dave from Darling Parlour. Yeah. Um, we were always good friends. I had a great time like guesting at their shop but it felt like in Roselle there was like a space for me to like carve out my own little thing down there that wouldn't be stepping on toes or just wouldn't be you know in in the real mix of like being next to five other shops already yeah so there was virtually like n zero competition in Roselle yeah and not that like that mattered to me in terms of like customers because I think I also went into it op wanting to open a private studio yeah but yeah, just the location was perfect and it, and it just was, there was something that like I could off, put into that place that wasn't there before. So you 
secured the place, mm -hmm. private studio space in Roselle. Yeah. Called Hand in Hand. Yeah. How do you how do you arrive at the name? Like uh, hand in hand. Like does it just sound catchy? Like that's right. I think we were like I was trying to think of something for so long and everything just sounded real cheesy or like a pub or something, you know, it was like, it sounded like a pub. The, the Rose and Anchor or something yeah, like yeah, that. Yeah. Like you come up with stuff like that and you're like, oh, it's just so boring. Uh, eventually I just like couldn't think of anything. And I, I was looking up um, like types of roses and you know how like sometimes flowers have like casual names? Yeah. Like a mum, a chrysanthemum's a mum or something like that. Yeah, yeah. Or, or like, yeah, I don't know what it is, but like with roses, they they have like other names. And there was there was just like a couple that I had like narrowed it down to. Like there's like a thank you rose. There was a um, for you, a rose called for you. And then there was one called hand in hand. So oh, cool. out of those three names, I just ended up going with hand in hand. Yeah. So like when you were sort of like putting together hand in hand were you sort of like taking little elements of shops that you previously worked in or were you trying to distance like this from previous things that you've done how, how do you basically build your dream shop you know yeah, that was actually really fun and it was because of those things it was because i was taking things that i'd loved from other places and it was not doing things that i'd seen in other places um, like, I guess in terms of like decoration and stuff, I'd always worked in like quiet, you know, street shops where it's like black, white and red. Yeah. <laughs> or it's like, uh, you know, when tattooing was like very like sailory vibes and that kind of like aesthetic with yeah. anchors and everything. And like, that was really, really cute. Um, and Bodhi's shop was like really inspirational as well for being something amazing to look at. Yeah. But it also just wasn't my style. Right. So it was like taking like fun things for me, um, but just something fresh and new as well. Yeah. Yeah. So basically from your introduction to tattooing in Campbelltown at like street shop, um, did you have this sort of like going into it from when you started getting tattooed and going into a street shop and all that sort of stuff. And like you said, there was no Instagram, yeah. all that sort of stuff. These sort of expectations of when you started there, you're like, this is what tattooing is, you know, mm -hmm. just doing everything that comes in the door and, and before seeing Shannon's work and stuff like that, not really thinking of, oh, I can push a style and all that sort of stuff. So yeah. like your expectation of what you thought your career was going to be. Mm versus the reality of, of what it sort of turned into. Yeah. How do you sort of like separate the two or how, how do you sort of like when you start it and you're like, wow, this is, this is tattooing, you know, it's dodgy, you know, like mm. a little bit sus at times doing everything to wanting to evolve and, and adapt. It's like, did you feel, oh, this isn't like after doing it for a while, this isn't what I thought it was going to be until you saw someone else and, and they gave you that sort of uh, a glimmer at what it could be, you mm. know? I think that's what it is. It, I, I didn't have any expectations of what I wanted it to be. It was just ended up about being what it could be. Right. Um, like, and that's what I learned from over all those years, having worked in so many different types of places for different types of people with different types of people. At the start of my career, I would never have ever thought into the future and thought I'd have such a cute little wholesome shop, like hand in hand, that's pink and friendly and warm. And like, you know, you have tea with your customers if you want, or like, it's just all very, very cute and sweet. Yeah. Coming from a street shop once upon a time, I would never have even considered that like a tat shop could look like that. Yeah. And over the years of evolving in my work and with the people I'm working around and as the quality got better and as that world opened up to me through private studios and all that kind of stuff, they were all just adding to my little like collection of ideas of things that like one day that's what I want to put in my shop or that's one thing that I won't do or something like that. So, and again with like guesting actually as well, like traveling overseas meeting tattooers you admire overseas like everyone has added to like the 
the experience and the actual reality of this shop that I have right now. It's it's all from just years of of learning and experiencing from them. Yeah, and I think also like hand in hand being the second shop that you had a hand in setting up. Yeah, you know, like I'm sure when you were you and the guys were like setting up Rosie's at the time or it would have been like nerve wracking, but exciting and stuff. You, mm. you may have thought at the time, this is, I'm going to be here forever. And then a few mm. years in, like you said, everyone had their own personal like side quests that they wanted yeah, to go yeah. do. So do you feel like what, like what felt different about setting up hand in hand to when you were doing it the first time? Did you feel more capable and more like, I've been through this before, I've done this before, you sort of came yeah. into it knowing what to sort of expect, setting up a second shop? Definitely, like I I would never also have then gone and opened hand in hand on my own had it not been for that experience of doing it with others. You know, yeah. like you've got like safety in numbers. So yeah, totally. We were all terrified opening Rosie's, but we had each other to like, come on, no, we can do this, like pump each other up. If I had to do go from working just for a boss to going straight on my own, who knows? Like I probably wouldn't have had like the confidence to do it. Yeah. Um, but I definitely learned a lot from opening Rosie's um, in terms of then going back to that like business element or this the um, you know not just tattooing but like all all those other side elements of having a shop that people don't normally think of. Yeah. So I definitely experienced that, learned from that from there, and then felt really comfortable opening hand in hand. And it was like fun as well then, because I wasn't so scared. I'd done stuff before, yeah. managed, you know, signing forms and doing all the like, uh, all the, um, you know, boring um, kind of stuff. Stuff. Yeah, yeah yeah doing all that kind of stuff but then I really got to just have fun with opening my shop at that point because yeah. I had like been through it and then now is just the time to be like yeah I want this in here and I want to do this I want people to like come in here and feel this and it was really really nice it was a lovely like little progression I haven't had the the honor to go visit yet but I really want to maybe in August I'll, I'll like yeah, come yeah, in yeah, and say up. hi but from what I've seen online it's like like peachy pink walls and beautiful furniture and a, that Liam Alvey painting in the, yeah. you know, it seems really homely and, it, and it, it feels really warm and inviting and stuff, yeah. which again is such a far cry from the black, white, red street <laughs> shops, yeah, yeah. you know, and, and it definitely, definitely feels like a relaxing space yeah. as well to get tattooed in, yeah. not chaos, the chaos of a street shop. Yeah. Like, do you feel, how, how do you sort of put yourself, like represent yourself in the shop mm -hmm. without it being the Sophia Bourne show? Yeah, yeah. And, and cause I feel like other shops where it's like, they might just like kit it out with traditional stuff cause that's what they like. But then they have people there that do realism. And it's like, how do you, how do you make a, a space that can kind of like encapsulate everyone? Yeah. I, I think that's a really good question because that was something I went into this shop w opening it that I was so aware of that I wanted to be careful of that mm. it wasn't all about me and you know the name isn't just like native flowers and you know <laughs> everything in it looks like my style. Yes I, I'm you know a bit like picky with the way I want things decorated and stuff but I still wanted to cover anyone who could potentially come and work at that shop. Um, it was never going to be like a shop where we only do traditional tattoos or we only do one style of tattoos. I knew that I wanted to have like a group of people who were all doing their own like separate things and that they could feel in this shop that they, they had the space to continue to do that. I didn't want to squash anyone's style or anything like that. So I was very aware of that. I guess I had fun with like some decorating and stuff, but um, I've just tried to keep like the artwork all very, uh, um, just all different styles and yeah. stuff. Like I've yeah. tried to like still have like all my nice things that I like really like, like, but like have a lot of different vibes in there as well. Yeah. 
and also like to give the artists who have then come and work there like the option okay if you want to like take down some stuff if you want to make your own corner of this shop like go do it I don't care either like you can put yourself into it yeah um otherwise like here is like a nice basic foundation that you can work in and then yeah add whatever you want to it I feel like that sort of comes across in like just the overall branding of the shop as well. Like all the, you guys have so much merch, so much like cool, yeah. cool different things as well for yeah. merch, but it's like, it's not tattoo-y yeah. in a way, which yeah. I like. It's, it's still very much a souvenir from the shop, but it's mm. not like, you know, the native flowers and stuff on it necessarily. It's, yeah. it's more rooted in, in just like nice design in yeah. general, which I, I think is cool for a tattoo shop because it's like... Yeah, if you're selling merch to represent the shop, then you're representing everyone that's in it. And it's sort of like you can't really just specifically do one thing that represents one of the people in the shop. Yeah, yeah. It's uh, it's cool. Like you guys, what have you done? You've done like bucket hats. Bucket hats, socks. We've done like bottle openers, bags, all kinds of bags, um, T-shirts, jumpers like zip up hoodies just everything yeah if like money and resources weren't a factor mm. what would be like the ultimate piece of merch to make oh. <laughs> <laughs> just something fucking oh, uh, intense yeah, I, just, I can't think on the spot of what that would be i i yeah i think homeware is cool Oh, homewares are cute. Like yeah. I've looked at it, and it's it's such a nightmare. Yeah. To to do anything, I think anything to do for the level that we're at in creating merch is quite hard because mm. I've have found that we're very much like small quantities of things. Even if we think it's a lot and it costs us a fortune to get it made, it's still not like we're sitting in the realm of ordering in a hundred thousand shirts. Yeah. So we're in this sort of like niche little area where the probably the numbers of things that we would want to have made is quite expensive still. It's not yeah. like we're ordering that much that we get that discount. It's just managing all those numbers. A lot of like those homewaresy things, it's like a minimum order of 1,000 plates or, yeah. or whatever it is, you know, it's yeah. like ridiculous. And it's like, I don't have a fucking warehouse to store, to store all this stuff. Yeah, yeah, that's probably, that's a good one, the homeware stuff. Yeah. That's, that would be it if you... No one, no one steal it. this idea, please. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but like, I feel as if hand in hand is so eclectic and diverse as well in terms of who you have working there now yeah. and like your guests like you've always i feel like every week you've got someone guesting almost it's yeah. like a, it's become like a bit of a destination for people and like you have so many like recurring people going yeah. and guesting where it's sort of like almost like their sydney home when they visit sydney yeah i would like to think of it as that for people and i think it is we definitely have new guests people that we've never met before but with the shop being so diverse in our artists, it means all that our guests are, div are diverse because they're extensions of us and they're like old friends or they're, you know, someone that Ogie admires online who I've never heard of their work before. So we have this mix of like our core, you know, seven people who are all doing super interesting things, doing their own style of work that's so amazing. And then from them, we're getting their little groups of people that come through. Yeah. Um, I think just from tattooing for 16 years, I've made a lot of friends. So now I have this shop that I can, you know, basically offer them, like, come, come to my house. Like, yeah. come it feels like that. you for once. It's so <laughs> nice. It yeah. feels like we're inviting friends to our home. Yeah, for sure. Um, I guess, like... I, I don't think I would ever, ever, ever be responsible enough to be a business owner. I, I, I know my fucking, I can't count. I can't do fucking anything. Nah, it's like, I, I know for sure it's not a, an ambition that I have yeah. because I, I don't think I could handle it. Mm -hmm. How do you find like juggling, like, you know, you're, you're a business person, like, cause uh, you're a co-owner with your partner. How do you manage, uh, 
like tattooing full time as well as being like the business boss lady because yeah. you seem to be tattooing like a fair bit too it's not sort of like yeah you know, one day a week or whatever yeah how do you juggle that um I think definitely like having that um dynamic with me and my partner because I am I am totally just a tattooer who ended up in this position <laughs> accidentally. I never wanted to open my own business. I never knew anything about that. I wouldn't say I'm even like really that intelligent enough to have done this <laughs> because I just come from like a, a tattoo background. I come from like making cute pictures on people and that being it. Um, you know, it took me a long time to learn how to do tax and I still don't even know if I do that properly. Uh, luckily, <laughs> you know, my partner's stepped in and does it. But um I definitely would never have thought that I would ever be a business owner. I still didn't feel like I'm ready. I think I just have, I just had that hustle that like I, from working in tattooing for so many years, that was like sort of in, engraved in me from tattooing for so long. And then I also had like a bit of the OCD-ness of like, yeah, I'll, I'll, if I want to do something, I'll fucking make it happen and I'll yeah. do it nice and I'll do it right. So I guess I'm coming into the business with that element of it. And of course, all the tattoo background um, in place. And then my partner, John, who is not a tattooer, who has also never opened a business, but he then has the space to do the other half of the things that I can't do. Right. Like I wouldn't know how to use zero accounting thing. Um, I don't have the time to learn how to use it because I am tattooing all the time. I don't want to, to sacrifice tattooing just to open a shop or be doing those things. I still want to tattoo all the time. Yeah. So he had the space and the time to learn that thing and I don't have to worry about it. It's not even in my mind. I come to work, I set up for my tattoo, I do all my drawings for it and, I, and uh, that's it for me. Yeah. I know he's got that covered. What do your family think, like, from the 17-year-old that went and was working in a street <laughs> shop? Like, what, they're like, what the fuck are you I doing? I think I've, like, fully made it now because I have yeah. my own shop. And I think it's only from when I had my own shop that they were like, oh, this is, like, you've made it. This is a real career. Yeah. Up until then, it <laughs> just didn't feel legitimate. they were still legitimate. expecting me to just be like, oh, this isn't going to work out because it's so weird for them. Yeah. Um, for, I can't even imagine like what they would have thought about me tattooing in those first few years. I, I know they said like, what the hell are you doing? Like, yeah. how long is this phase going to last? Or, <laughs> yeah. You know, things like that. So I think for a long time, they were just like, what the hell? And how have you made this last? And opening this shop really like showed them like, oh, okay, this is like successful. This is a thing. This is something that she's like really hard grafted for and is gonna last yeah that's so cool yeah i'm sure they'd just be like so stoked and just i hope so <laughs> yeah. oh. <laughs> be proud of me <laughs> not that i ever cared if my parents are proud of me either because yeah it's just who i was as a teenager <laughs> yeah <laughs> so i'm gonna true. do it anyway <laughs> yeah exactly i feel like yeah the, the the parents the parents expectation versus reality as yeah, well you know very different very so we, we sort of wrap it up by, you know, who's working at Hand in Hand, you know, yeah. how can people find you? Um, the, the group of us is me, Ogi Tattoo, who is also Terrible, Terrible Things, um, which is his little alter ego. We've got Elizabeth Huxley-May, Ellie Tattoo, Beth Lonsdale, Mish, and Ben Dukakis at the moment. Um, and yeah, so am I supposed to be doing shout outs to anyone else? You can do whatever you want. Our group. <laughs> whatever you want. Shout out and whoever and you want. heaps of like reoccurring artists, like you said. So you can find all of our work and, and all of those people who are, you know, always coming back to visit on our Instagram mainly is, is the right place. So hand in hand underscore tattoo, I think is the Instagram. Cool. Yeah. Sophia, thank you so much for coming down and joining the podcast. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks for having me.
This podcast is recorded with the team at Stupid Old Studios here in Melbourne. Uh, for all your video and audio podcast needs and much, much more, visit stupidoldstudios.com.